<coughs> Thank you, Kevin, for that winsome introduction. And um, it's an honor for me to be invited to give these lectures, especially given the three distinguished uh, speakers before me. Um, so I look forward to being with you for the next uh, six days. The overall topic is the God we worship. <clears throat> and this evening, the project. Is the sound OK? Everybody, it's OK? Theology comes with many different configurations. In the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas structured theology to fit the demands of Scantia. He began with the proof of the existence of the object of this particular science, namely God. And then reality is so structured, he argued, that there must be something that is the unconditioned condition of all that is not identical with itself. This we all call God, says Aquinas. The fact that God is the unconditioned condition of all that is not identical with God implies, so Aquinas argued in a long chain of deductions, implies that God is simple, perfect, good, infinite, immutable, eternal, and I think that's only the first third of the list of things that uh, he concludes. The theology that John Calvin developed in the Institutes had a very different configuration. It presented a way of interpreting scripture that was aimed at cultivating in readers what Calvin called piety. Piety being understood, he said, as that reverence joined with love of God, which the knowledge of God's benefits induces. Whereas the doctrine of divine simplicity had looming importance in the configuration that Aquinas gave to theology, it had none at all in Calvin's configuration. A good deal of theology, 30, is what one might call conciliar theology. It takes as its basic subject matter doctrines debated and decided in the early ecumenical councils, Trinity and Incarnation being foremost among those. Yet other theology you might call confessional theology. It takes as its basic subject matter doctrines formulated in one or another of the Reformation confessions, election and justification prominent among those. And over the centuries, a great deal of theology with epistemological concerns in mind, has employed revelation as its overarching category. Now, anybody who composes a treatise on Christian theology could write as his or her final sentence, this is the God we Christians worship. Aquinas could have written those words as the final sentence of Summa Theologiae. Calvin could have written them as the final sentence of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Schleiermacher could have written them as the final sentence of the Christian faith. Christian theology is about the God Christians worshiped. There is no other. There aren't two gods, one whom Christian theologians write about and one whom Christians worship. But in setting as the topic for these lectures, the God we worship, I do not have in mind to develop a systematic theology or of one or another of the above configurations at the end of which I could append the sentence, this is the God we Christians worship. Rather than appending a reference to worship, I'm going to begin with worship. And rather than beginning with a mere reference to worship, my project is to make explicit the understanding of God implicit in Christian worship. And then, insofar as we have time, to articulate and defend that understanding. So my project could be called liturgical theology. As such, my project is similar to, but also significantly different from Karl Barth's project in church dogmatics. Barth also starts from the Christian liturgy. But while recognizing that there's more to liturgy than proclamation, which he understands as speech about God, Barth focuses exclusively on proclamation. And while recognizing that proclamation does not only occur in preaching and the sacraments, Bart focuses on those. And in turn of those two, preaching and the sacraments, preaching gets far and away the lion's share of Bart's attention. So dogmatic theology turns out to be, for Bart, essentially critical reflection on the content of the church's preaching. Whereas Bart starts from preaching, I'm going to be starting from the liturgy as a whole. <clears throat> 
And whereas Bart focuses on what should be said about God in preaching, my project is to, under, is to identify the understanding of God implicit in our liturgical actions as a whole, to make explicit what is implicit, and then, once again, insofar as we have time, to articulate and defend that understanding. When we offer our intercessions, we don't speak about God, we speak to God. My question is, what is the understanding of God implicit in that liturgical action? To explain how I understand this project and why I think it's worth undertaking it, I must begin with some comments on the nature of the Christian liturgy. Strictly speaking, there is, of course, no such thing as the Christian liturgy. There are only Christian liturgies in the plural. However, among the liturgies of the Orthodox Church, the Catholic, the Episcopal, the Lutheran churches, and the Reformed and Presbyterians, there is a great deal of convergence. I'm going to concentrate on the points of convergence among these liturgies, not on the idiosyncrasies, but on the similarities. And at the end of this lecture, I will ex explain why I've chosen to focus on the points of conversion among those liturgies, Orthodox, Catholic, Episcopal, Lutheran, Reformed, Presbyterian. It is my judgment, shared by many people, that the Russian Orthodox theologian Alexander Shmeyman was the finest liturgical theologian of the Orthodox Church in the 20th century. In the opening chapter of his Introduction to Liturgical Theology, Shmeyman, speaking of the liturgical revival movement that took place in Orthodoxy, Catholicism, and various parts of Protestantism in the latter part of the 19th century, and the first half or so of the 20th century, Schmemann says, quote, the substance of the movement lies in the genuine discovery of worship as the life of the church, the public act, which actualizes the nature of the church as the body of Christ. And then speaking more specifically of the Orthodox Church in the next chapter, he says, quote, the worship of the Orthodox Church is conducted according to ordo, O-R-D-O, that is, according to definite regulations. So in the comments about liturgy that are going to follow for the next 25 minutes, whatever, my goal is to arrive at a place where we can understand what Schmemann meant when he talked about liturgy as actualizing the church and what he meant by definite regulations. Because I think what he's saying is true not just for the Orthodox liturgy, but for liturgies in general. Let me begin with some comments on what I suppose you could call the ontology of liturgy. Uh, the ontology of liturgy proves more complex than you might originally have thought, so um, bear with me. Liturgy is often thought of as consisting of texts. A liturgy is thought of as something that you can hold in your hand. No one who participated in the liturgical revival movement of the 19th and the 20th centuries thought of liturgy that way. And no one influenced by the movement thinks of liturgy that way. Of course, there are liturgical texts, but a liturgy no more consists of a text than a musical work consists of a score. A liturgical text exists not for its own sake, but for the sake of enactments of the liturgy. The text guides enactments in the same way that the text for a drama guides performances of the drama, and that the score for a musical work guides performances of the work. It is enactments of the liturgy, not texts, that Schmemann had in mind when he spoke of liturgy as actualizing the church. <laughs> Now, when Schmemann refers to the liturgy of the Orthodox Church, he is not, however, referring to any particular liturgical enactment on a given Sunday in a given place. Which one would that be? He's referring to something that has been repeatedly enacted in the Orthodox Church, with only relatively minor variations, Sunday after Sunday, for hundreds of years in multiple places. Now, anything that can be repeatedly and multiply enacted is a universal. So the Orthodox liturgy is a universal. More specifically, it's a type. 
A type whose enactments, or instantiations, consist of sequences of actions of certain kinds. And so too for the contemporary Catholic liturgy, the various contemporary Episcopal liturgies, the various contemporary Presbyterian liturgies, and so forth. One and all, they're capable of being repeatedly enacted. So one and all, they are universals. One and all, they are, here it goes, types of sequences of actions of certain kinds. The kinds of actions that go to make up one of these types of sequences always, includes, always include bodily actions of various kinds. When the assembly enacts its liturgy, the members of the assembly do things with their bodies. Prominent among these bodily actions are listening, speaking, and singing. But the prominence of those should not lead us to overlook the fact that there are many others as well. Standing, kneeling, processing, crossing oneself, distributing bread and wine, eating bread and wine, sprinkling with water, dunking in water, closing one's eyes, dropping money in a container, washing, kissing, prostrating, and more besides. Bodily actions. On the other hand, it is by no means the case that all the actions performed in the enactment of a Christian liturgy are bodily actions. Mainly this is true because performances of many of the bodily actions count as performances of actions that are not themselves bodily. The priest at the beginning of an enactment in English of the Orthodox Liturgy of John Chrysostom pronounces these words, Blessed be the kingdom of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forevermore. The priest's pronouncing of those words is a bodily action, The priest uses his mouth and vocal cords to perform the action. But his performance of the bodily action of pronouncing those words counts as his doing something else, namely blessing the kingdom of the Holy Trinity. And that act of blessing is not a bodily action. I'll be developing this point in my fourth lecture. (laughs) The next point to be made about the ontology of liturgy can best be made, I think, by first making some observations about music and then pointing to the similarity of liturgy to music. So here goes. When a composer writes a score for a musical composition, what he essentially does is institute a set of rules for a correct musical performance. Now there's a new way for a musical performance to be correct. What the composer writes down in the score, however, never specifies the complete set of rules. Always the composer takes for granted certain rules for correctness that are embedded in the musical culture of the time. Rules for correctness in playing the violin, for example. Let me call the total set of correctness rules that the composer institutes, both those specified in the score and those that he presupposes as part of musical culture. Let me call the whole pack the script for the composition. I am, of course, stretching the ordinary meaning of the word script here. (laughs) The musical work itself that the composer has composed, in distinction from the set of rules that constitute the script for correct performance, is a sequence, is a type of sequence of sounds of certain kinds. Specifically, the musical work itself is the sequence type that is instantiated of sounds that is instantiated when the correctness rules that the composer instituted are faithfully followed. And since the musical work can be instantiated in multiple performances, it too is a universal. Now an important part of the conceptuality that we use for thinking and talking about music is that a musical work can not only be performed correctly, that belongs to its very essence, it seems to me, but also incorrectly. It's performed incorrectly when at some point the correctness rules that the composer instituted are not faithfully followed. An incorrect performance is still a performance of the work. On the other hand, it does sometimes happen that a performance departs so far (laughs) from the relevant correctness rules that we say, that's just not a performance of the work. Corresponding to the script, 
the rules for performance and to the work of music that the script determines. There's a certain know-how on the part of musicians, specifically the know-how of knowing how to perform the work correctly and beyond that of knowing how to perform it excellently. In our musical culture, knowing how to perform one work of music correctly and excellently comes along with knowing how to perform a rather wide range of works correctly and excellently. If you can perform one Beethoven sonata, you've got, apart from some digital dexterity, the know-how for performing the others. So now with those points about music in mind, let's look at liturgy. Consider the text for some liturgy. For example, the text for the Holy Eucharist Rite One contained in the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. That text specifies a set of rules for a correct liturgical performance and enactment. But just as a musical score never specifies the full set of correctness rules for a musical performance, so also that liturgical text of the Holy, for the Holy Eucharist Rite One does not specify the complete set of rules. Some are to be found in the liturgical culture of the Episcopal Church. As in the case of music, let's call the complete set of rules for a correct liturgical enactment, both those specified in the text and those embedded in the liturgical culture, let's call the whole set the script for the liturgy. The script. When discuss discussing music, I might have mentioned that for some works, musical works, there's no score and never has been. The entire set of correctness rules is to be found in the relevant part of the culture. And so too with liturgy. For some liturgies, there is no text and never has been. None of the correctness rules has ever been written down. The entire script is to be found in the relevant liturgical culture. The liturgies that I'm going to be discussing are not of that unwritten down type, <laughs> but the ones I'm going to be discussing are those that have fairly elaborate scripts. The Eucharistic liturgy that the Episcopal Church designates as the Holy Eucharist Rite One, in distinction from the script for that liturgy, is then the sequence type of actions of certain kinds that is instantiated when the script for that liturgy is faithfully followed. But as with music, an important part of the conceptuality that we use for thinking and talking about liturgy is that a liturgy can not only be correctly enacted, but you can make mistakes. So to summarize, to participate in the enactment of a liturgy is to perform scripted, or if you prefer, rule-governed actions, just as to participate in the performance of some work of music is to perform scripted, rule-governed actions. And that's what Schmemann was alluding to when he said that, quote, the worship of the Orthodox Church is conducted according to definite regulations. What Schmemann calls the regulations for the Orthodox liturgy, I'm calling the script. And the Orthodox liturgy itself just is the liturgy for which those correctness rules are the script. Corresponding to the script for a liturgy, and corresponding to the liturgy itself, which the script determines, there's a certain know-how on the part of those who participate in enactments of the liturgy. Specifically, the know-how of knowing how to enact the liturgy correctly, and beyond that, of enacting it well, excellently. It's my impression that this liturgical know-how differs somewhat from the correspondingly musical know-how in that it's less generalized. As I said, the know-how of a trained pianist puts him in the position of knowing how to perform both Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 16 and Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 17. Though if he's never played the latter, he's got to acquire a few digital skills. I think not so for liturgy, or less so. Liturgical know-how, it seems to me, approaches being liturgy-specific. If one has the know-how for participating in an enactment of Rite One of the Episcopal Church, then one also has the know-how for participating in Rite Two. But the know-how that enables one to participate in one or another of those two Episcopal liturgies is not one that enables one to participate in an enactment of the Orthodox liturgy of John, of John Chrysostom. One is not completely lacking in know-how, 
But look, if you've never before attended an enactment of the Orthodox liturgy, best to look around and observe how it's done before you try to do it yourself. Be that as it may, liturgy is like music, and that one acquires some particular liturgical know-how by being inducted into the social practice for the exercise of this know-how. There are others who possess the know-how in question. Liturgical know-how is a shared know-how. And the know-how is acquired from those who already have it. Liturgical know-how is passed on. There's a tradition of a particular liturgical know-how. Now, it seems to me that in principle, one can worship God, what do you think, without following any script, any rules for correctness, and without having acquired any relevant know-how by induction to a social practice. I think this happens less often than one might initially suppose. Almost all of us in worshiping God do follow a script, a set of rules, and have acquired some know-how from others. Nonetheless, it seems to me possible that somebody would read a few passages from the, Old, from the New Testament and begin worshiping the God of whom she has read without knowing and following any rules for correctness and being completely ignorant of those ways of worshiping God that Christians have passed on to each other. I think that's possible. And if that's correct, then Christian liturgical actions are best thought of as one species of acts of Christian worship in general. An exceedingly prominent species, probably the most prominent species, but only a species. Liturgy is a species of worship. Acts of worship are liturgical when they are scripted. Most liturgical worship is communal. In talking about liturgy, Schmemann clearly has his eye on communal worship. But I think scripted worship need not be communal. One can follow a script in one's own private devotions. Lots of people do. So here's my suggestion so far. Christian worship is liturgical when it is the scripted performance of acts of worship as opposed to non-scripted performances. So I introduced my discussion of liturgy by saying that I was going to aim at arriving at a place where we could discern not only the meaning, but the plausibility for liturgy in general of two comments made by Alexander Schmemann. One comment that the church actualizes herself in the enactment of the liturgy, and the other that the orthodox liturgy is conducted according to an ordo, what he calls an ordo, that is definite regulations. What Schmemann call, calls the ordo of the orthodox liturgy, I'm calling the script. And I've been arguing that all liturgies, not just the Orthodox liturgy, have a script. To participate in the enactment of some liturgy is to participate in scripted action. So what remains obscure is what Schmemann means when he says that the church actualizes herself in her enactment of the liturgy. Earlier I suggested that that's got something to do with understanding liturgy as consisting not of texts, but as a way of doing something. But that falls far short of explaining just what it is, or what Shemaimon has in mind, when he says that the church actualizes herself in the enactment of the liturgy. So let me try to figure out what he's got in mind there. Just as I judge Schmemann to be the finest 20th century liturgical theologian of the Orthodox Church, so I judge the Swiss theologian, French Swiss theologian, Jean-Jacques Van Allman, to be the finest 20th century liturgical theologian of the Reformed tradition. In the opening chapters of his Opus Magnum, Worship, Its Theology and Practice, Von Allman offers three distinct approaches or takes on the Christian liturgy. The Christian liturgy, he says, is the recapitulation of the history of salvation. It is the epiphany of the church, and it is, thirdly, the end and future of the world. I interpret what von Allman has in mind when he describes the liturgy as the epiphany of the church, 
as essentially the same as what Schmemann had in mind when he described the liturgy as the actual actualization of the church. But liturgy is the epiphany of the church. Phenomenon says, by its worship, the church becomes itself, becomes conscious of itself, and confesses itself as a distinct entity. But to describe the enactment of the liturgy as the epiphany of the church is very nearly as obscure as describing it as the actualization of the church. So what might von Almen and Schmemann have in mind? What it seems to me they have in mind begins to become clear when Schmemann sets his view over against an opposing view that he finds common among his Russian Orthodox brothers and sisters. Here's what he says in one passage. The fact is that worship has ceased to be understood as a function of the church. In the contemporary approach to worship, there is the characteristic absence of an understanding of it as an expression of the church, as the creation of the church, and as the fulfillment of the church. The individual believer entering the church does not feel that he's a participant and celebrant of worship, does not know that in this act of worship, he along with the others who together with him are constituting the church, is called to express the church's new life. He's become an object of worship. It is celebrated for his nourishment, so that as an individual, he may satisfy his religious needs. The purpose of the cult is thought of precisely as the bestowal of an individual spiritual experience, spiritual food. For the membership of the church, worship has ceased to be the church's self-evidencing. I take Schmemann's point to be the following. Many members of the church think of it as a service organization, catering to their religious or spiritual needs and desires. And the clergy enact the liturgy for the benefit of those who find it spiritually nourishing and edifying. It is to this purely individualistic, functional understanding of the liturgy that Schmemann and Van Allman are deeply opposed. Both insist that the liturgy is not something enacted by the clergy for the purpose of satisfying spiritual and religious needs of the congregants. It's the church that enacts the liturgy, not the clergy. Though the church does so under the leadership of the clergy, the liturgy is not something that clerics do. And the church enacts the liturgy not to satisfy the needs and desires of individual congregants, but to worship God. The church blesses God, praises God, thanks God, confesses her sins to God, petitions God, listens to God's word, celebrates the Eucharist. It's not the individual congregants who do these things simultaneously. It's the assembled body that does these things. And further, phenomenon Schmemann want to say that these are not just to be numbered among the lots of good things that the church does. It was for the performance of such actions that God created the church. When the church assembles for communal worship, she does what she was called into existence to do. The church exists, exists to worship God in Christ. So it's in this sense that in enacting the liturgy, and now we get their words, she actualizes herself, manifests herself. The liturgy, to use Manalman's phrase, is an epiphany, manifestation of the church. But it's important to add right here that neither Schmemann nor von Amman was of the view that the church exists only for the purpose of worship. And that is only in worship that she actualizes herself. The church is called to acknowledge God throughout her existence, not only when gathered for worship, but also in her life in the everyday. In his little book, For the Life of the World, Schmemann powerfully develops the point that the life of the, Christ that the, life of the Christian is to be conducted in such a way that the whole of it is an acknowledgement of who God is and of what God has done. Yet, both Schmemann and von Amann are of the view that it is especially in the enactment of the liturgy, more than in the work of the faithful in the world, that the nature and the purpose of the church become manifest. And I think they're right about that. 
I think it, I too think that it is especially in the enactment of the liturgy that the nature and the purpose of the church becomes most evident. Do I affirm what I've interpreted Schmemann's meaning when he says that in the enactment of the church, the church, of the liturgy, the church actualizes herself? And what I've interpreted Van Almond's meaning when he says that the liturgy is the epiphany of the church? I do want to go on immediately to add another note. In the enactment of the liturgy, not only does the church act in such a way as to actualize and manifest herself, God also acts. Both Schmemann and Van Almen affirm that point in their writing. But I think we run the risk of serious distortion if we don't add it right at the beginning. Okay, that was arriving at a point where what, Van Almen's, what Schmemann said makes sense. I want now to move on to explain what I have in mind when I describe my project in these lectures as making explicit the understanding of God implicit in the Christian liturgy, okay? So suppose that an early Christian liturgy had come about in the following way. Some Christian, early Christian of considerable theological sophistication composed a liturgy that gave expression to his theological convictions. For example, this Christian, having concluded from the resurrection, Pentecost, and various things Jesus said, that God was in some yet inexplicable way intimately related to Jesus and the Spirit, in conclusion that lots of his fellow Christians were also coming to, this early Christian who was composing a liturgy might have included as the opening or closing of his liturgy something like the final verse of St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the early Christian of some theological sophistication, believing that we wrong God by our disobedience and indifference, might have decided to include a prayer for forgiveness on the model of that to be found in the paradigmatic prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples. If that's how things had gone, and if we had been around at the time, we could have asked him to spell out for us the theological convictions that went into his framing the liturgy as he did. Some of those convictions would have received explicit expression in the liturgy, and we would already have noticed them. For example, the proto-Trinitarianism of that Pauline greeting. But others would have remained implicit. For example, the conviction that God can be wronged. It's highly unlikely that our theologian would have explicitly stated in the liturgy that God can be wronged. He would simply have composed a prayer for forgiveness. So in responding to our request to spell out for us the theological convictions that shaped his liturgy, he would have mentioned his conviction that we wrong God. And we would have noted that, oh, that's why he concluded, included a prayer for forgiveness in his liturgy. Of course, he would almost certainly not have been fully conscious of all the ways in which his theology shaped his liturgical composition. What I've just described for you is pure fantasy. All the evidence points to the fact that the early Christian liturgies were not composed. They emerged and developed organically, mainly from two sources, the readings and prayers of the Jewish synagogue and what transpired in the upper room when Jesus had his Last Supper. And until the invention of printing, when liturgical texts became common, liturgy continued to change and develop organically under a multiplicity of influences. Under the influence of theological convictions, to be sure, but also under the influence of practices of the Roman imperial court, practices of the Byzantine imperial court, changing views concerning the special status of the clergy, the felt need to exclude the non-catechized and non-baptized from the Eucharist, packs of influences. Eventually, after these liturgies had just sprouted, some leaders of the church did do what one might call compose a liturgy, 
Maybe St. Basil composed the liturgy that the Orthodox know as the liturgy of St. Basil. And maybe John Chrysostom was composed the liturgy that they know as the liturgy of St. John. Though it's interesting that in neither case do we have clear evidence that, they didn't, that those two people did in fact compose those liturgies. But we do know that Calvin composed a liturgy for his little church in Strasbourg. And the best known example, we know that Thomas Cranmer composed the liturgy in the original Book of Common Prayer. Now, neither Calvin nor Cranmer began from scratch in composing their liturgy in the way that Beethoven started from scratch in composing the ninth, his fifth symphony. Neither has anybody else who has composed a liturgy ever begun from scratch. Nobody has ever done anything more than compose a revision of liturgies that were not themselves composed, but that developed organically under a multiplicity of influences. Now, had we been around at the time, we could have asked Cranmer, himself a sophisticated theologian, to spell out for us the theological convictions that led him to revise earlier liturgies as he did into the liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer. And his answer would have gone some way towards articulating the understanding of God explicit and implicit in the liturgy. But since it was not a start from scratch composition, much of it was just taken over, almost certainly Cranmer would not have been fully aware of everything that went into the composition of his liturgy. So here's my conclusion. Since no liturgy has ever been composed from scratch, there's never anybody we can ask concerning any of the traditional liturgies to spell out for us the theological convictions which went into composing the liturgy as it is, because nobody has just been the composer of it. We can get partial answers from Cranmer and his like. Nowadays, we can get partial answers from array of, an array of liturgical revision committees, but the answers are never anything more than partial. Liturgical revision committees will generally be quite conscious of the theological convictions that shape the revisions they make, but they'll be much less conscious, or maybe not conscious at all, of the theological convictions implicit in what they just take over. You see the question. So how then, if we can't ask somebody, or if we can ask somebody but never get full answers, how then do we identify the theological understandings implicit in the liturgy? No problem identifying the explicit ones. The present-day Episcopal liturgy opens with the celebrant saying, Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is explicitly understood as here as Trinity. That's obvious. But God is implicitly understood as being of a sort whom it's appropriate to bless. The celebrant doesn't declare that God is a being of that sort. And so, of course, he doesn't explain what it is about God that makes it appropriate to bless God. He or she just goes ahead and blesses God. So once again, how do we go about making explicit, identify, and formulate the understanding of God implicit in the liturgy? And what are we trying to do when we try to do this? What is it to make the implicit explicit. Let me quote a few sentences, phrases from Schmemann. The, ta the task of liturgical theology, he says, is to uncover the theological logos, his term, logos of the liturgy. It's theological meaning. I like this next sentence. The liturgy, he says, contains theology in code, as it were, and it's the task of the liturgical theologian to decode the code, to translate what is expressed by the language of worship into the language of theology. In liturgical theology, I'm still quoting him, the liturgical tradition arrives at dogmatic self-consciousness. What Schmemann here calls decoding the theology that the liturgy contains is the same as what I call making explicit the understanding of God implicit in the liturgy. Given a particular liturgy, always some of what it says about, says about God will be explicit. But always a lot of it will be implicit. 
To make the implicit explicit, we start from some particular liturgical act, or from some type of liturgical act, or from the liturgy as a whole. And here's what we ask. What would God have to be like for it to make sense to perform this particular liturgical act, or this type of liturgical act, or the liturgy as a whole? What would God have to be like for it to make sense to bless God? What would God have to be like for it to make sense for us to address God, whatever the content of our address? What would God have to be like for it to make sense to worship God in the way that Christians do? It's by asking such questions that we make explicit the understanding of God implicit in the liturgy. It's by asking and answering such questions that we make explicit what Shmeimon calls the theological logos of the liturgy. Now, my project, it would be worthwhile to ask what the liturgy as a whole says about God. Not only what it says implicitly, but also what it says explicitly. But in these eight lectures, I'm going to focus on what the liturgy says implicitly and not say all that much about what it says explicitly. And I've got two reasons for that. First, what a liturgy says explicitly about God is relatively obvious as compared to what it says implicitly. We can go on to develop the explicit understanding, give it theological articulation, defend it against objections, and so forth. But identifying and formulating it is relatively easy. It's less easy to identify the implicit. And I prefer undertaking the more difficult task rather than the easier task. And secondly, the explicit presupposes the implicit, right? Blessing God with explicitly Trinitarian language presupposes that God is the sort of being whom it's appropriate to bless. My project is to uncover the fundamental presuppositions of what we Christians do when we enact the liturgy. I think of the understanding of God implicit in the liturgy as coming in three levels, as it were. The deepest level is the understanding of God implicit in the liturgy as a whole. The understanding of God implicit in the Christian liturgy as a whole is significantly different, for example, from the understanding of God implicit in the temple liturgy of ancient Israel. So the deepest, what's implicit in the entirety? The next level up is the understanding of God implicit in the various types of liturgical actions. For example, in both the liturgical act of praising God and the liturgical act of interceding with God, the people address God. And so deeper than the understanding of God implicit in praising and deeper than that implicit in interceding is the understanding of God implicit in addressing God no matter what the content of one's address. And then the next level up from what is implicit in the various types of liturgical acts is obviously what's implicit in the particular content of liturgical acts of a certain type. What's implicit in our address to God whose content is praise? What's implicit in our address to God whose content is intercession? And so forth. In these lectures, I'm going to focus almost entirely on the two deepest levels of implicitness. What's implicit in the liturgy as a whole and what's implicit in the basic types of liturgical actions. It's only when we get to the last lecture and talk about what's implicit uh, in the Eucharist that we're going to be operating on the third level, almost exclusively. One more word here. My description of what it is to make explicit the understanding of God implicit in the liturgy may have given you the impression that it's easy to understand what goes on in one and another liturgical act, that the hard work begins when we go beyond understanding the act to try to identify the, under, the understanding of God implicit in the act. And that the hard work continues when we try to 
develop that understanding theologically. But the impression is mistaken. What we're going to discover is that a lot of hard work often goes on and just trying to figure out what's going on in the liturgical act. The hard work doesn't just come after that. Now, moving toward a conclusion. Why is it worth doing? In the course of arguing for the importance of liturgical theology, Schmemann speaks of, quote, the inadequacy and evil effects of scholastic theology. He means academic theology, which, and I'm speaking in a seminar, right? Which, so he says, the Orthodox Church borrowed from the West. He quotes favorably the saying that comes to us from the ancient church, lex orandi, lex esquidendi, the law, the, law, the rule of them. Prayer is the rule of faith. And he says that the liturgy is not an authority or a locus theologicus. It is the ontological condition of theology and so forth. Now these impressions, these passages, and I could quote you some others, give the impression that for Schmemann, liturgical theology is a very exalted enterprise indeed, much higher than school theology and systematic theology and so forth. Um, but I judge that when we bring other passages from Schmemann into the picture, we have to conclude that the impression given by those exalted passages read in isolation is mistaken. His view is actually more modest. In the introduction to liturgical theology, he describes liturgical theology as one among other theological sub-disciplines. Then he says this, dogmatic theology is the discipline which unites the conclusions of all other theological disciplines and brings them into a balanced and convincing whole. And then he goes on to compare liturgical theology to biblical theology. Just as between scripture's text and its use in dogmatics, there stands biblical theology, so between worship as a fact and its use in dogmatics, there stands liturgical theology. So liturgical theology is one among the sub-disciplines that dogmatic theology brings into unity. My understanding of the importance of liturgical theology is different. I don't think of it as a theological subdiscipline that the super discipline of dogmatic theology brings into a balanced and convincing whole with other theological sub subdisciplines and so forth. I think that liturgical theology is itself a version of dogmatic theology. It doesn't simply provide matter for the dogmatic theologian. Here's how I see it. At the beginning of this lecture, I observed that theology, and I had in mind dogmatic or systematic theology, has been shaped or configured in lots of different ways over the course of the centuries. And I mentioned a few of the different configurations, Calvin, Aquinas, so forth, might have mentioned more. I see liturgical theology as joining those as another way of configuring Christian theology. The understanding of God implicit and explicit in the liturgy is its starting point, its point of origin, its source, in one sense of the somewhat ambiguous term source. And it's that starting point that gives to it, instead of starting from revelation or arguments for God's existence and so forth, or the Christian consciousness and Schleiermacher, it's that starting point that gives to it its distinct configuration. I see it like this. The ecumenical creeds have an authoritative status when the church, within the church at large, or they should have. As a Protestant, I hold that the authority of the ecumenical creeds is very weighty, though not final. In principle, it's possible that good reasons would emerge for revising one or, an as one or another aspect of those formulations. But until such good reasons turn up, the creeds are to be accepted. The burden of proof lies on those who think they should be revised on some point. I hold that the understanding of God implicit and explicit in the points of convergence of the traditional time-tested liturgies of the church also have an authoritative status. Less than that of the Nicene and Apostles' Creed, but nonetheless, I think, weighty. Here's why. Over more than 1,500 centuries around the globe, 
Members of the church have assembled each Sunday to enact one or another of these liturgies. These have stood the test of time by massive numbers of Christians. If there were something seriously mistaken, at least in their points of convergence, in the understanding of God implicit and explicit in these liturgies, I think it's enormously likely that that part of the liturgy in which that mistaken understanding was embedded would have been rejected. Christian worshipers would have felt in their bones that it had to go. My guess is that by now, there are some Protestants in this audience who are becoming increasingly worried that I have abandoned the sola scriptura principle of Protestantism. To them, let me say that though the understanding of God implicit and explicit in the liturgy is the point of origin of liturgical theology, the source from which it arises, its basis, the basis on which it's constructed, is not confined to that source. Its basis is much more comprehensive. Having identified the understanding of God implicit and explicit in the liturgy, the liturgical theologian doesn't then move on to something else. Instead, he develops that understanding theologically by appealing to whatever he judges to be true, relevant, and defensible. That, then, is the basis, whatever he appeals to. Whatever he appeals to in the course of giving theological articulation. And if he's a Protestant of a traditional sort, Scripture will occupy a uniquely authoritative role in that basis. But the sola scriptura principle never meant that the theologian appeals to nothing but scriptural quotations in developing his theology. Nor does it mean that all theology must take the form of Calvin's Institutes, namely the form of a guide to interpretation of scripture. So I submit that between liturgical theology as such and the sola scriptura principle, rightly understood, there is no tension. And now to conclude. Let me explain more fully than I did before why I've chosen to focus my attention on the Orthodox liturgy, the Catholic liturgy, the Episcopal liturgy, some of the Lutheran liturgies, and some of the Reformed liturgies, or more precisely on their points of convergence. Most Christians today enact one or another of these liturgies in their worship. But around the world, millions and millions do not. Why not bring those others into the picture? The Pentecostals, evangelicals of various sorts. I have three reasons for focusing on the traditional liturgies. One is a consideration that I alluded to earlier. The traditional liturgies are liturgies that have stood the test of time across many centuries by millions of Christians, by billions actually. And for that reason, it seems to me the understanding of God implicit and explicit in those liturgies has more authority, carries more weight, more gravitas, than one composed on his own, say, by some, you name it, Pentecostal pastor in Houston for next Sunday's service in his church. The theology implicit and explicit in the latter is more likely, not necessarily this, but more likely to be quirky, distorted, highly idiosyncratic, and so forth. Second, the script of many of these alternative liturgies changes from week to week, usually in accord with the preferences of the pastor. And when it does change from week to week, usually much less of the script is written down than is the case for traditional liturgies. And what this implies is that it's much more difficult for me to get hold of it to talk about what's implicit and explicit in it. And here's my third reason. The traditional liturgy, liturgies have a depth, a richness, a beauty, that in my limited experience, these contemporary alternative liturgies lack. In my limited experience, the latter tend to strip elements out of the traditional liturgies, reduce the imagery, make the language chatty and prosaic, so that everybody can understand at once what's meant. There remains almost no echo of the enormous devotion and creativity that the early church and its successors poured into its liturgies. The most radical example of this reductive flattening out that I have encountered, once again, my experience is limited, was a Sunday morning service that consisted of nothing more, I speak literally here, nothing more, 
then a praise band performing for about half an hour, followed by a perfunctory prayer spoken by the leader of the band, and a sermon by the minister, and nothing more, apart from dismissal. If the alternative contemporary liturgies that I've experienced are typical of these liturgies as a whole, then these liturgies do not represent a fresh burst of liturgical creativity, but represent instead the stripping out from the, liturgical, from the traditional liturgies of all sorts of components. Thus, we can discuss the theological implication of the acts to be found in these alternative contemporary liturgies by discussing those to be found in the traditional liturgies, since there are almost no acts in the former, the, the present day ones, that are not to be found in the traditional. My focus on the traditional liturgies does, of course, I realize, pose a question to the alternative contemporary liturgies. Namely, I'm again trading on my limited experience. Namely, why have they stripped so many things out? Why was there no confession of sins in that service that I attended? Why were there no intercessions? Why was scripture not read, apart from the preacher in the course of a sermon quoting a few sentences? And why was there almost no sense of the majesty and awesomeness of God? Is there an understanding of God implicit in this radical stripping out that is different from the understanding of God to be found in the traditional liturgies? If so, what is that different understanding of God? I think it would be worth exploring the answer to that question, but I'm not in the position of being able to do so with any authority whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you.